I remember the first meeting with Grimshaws, we had to be a bit, what's the phrase, ballsy. It was a, an absolutely uh, insane idea concocted by a group of lovely people. And the insane idea was to build the biggest greenhouse in the world. And we said, look, we're giving the opportunity to build the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, the only problem is we've got no money. And I don't think you're supposed to talk to signature architects like that. So when they said they'd call us, it felt very much like, don't call us, we'll call you. And to our amazement, they called back the following day. The idea behind Eden was ridiculously simple. It was inspired by Arthur Conan Doyle's Lost Worlds and the notion that somewhere in the world there was a lost civilization in which all the bounty that was put on Earth had been gathered together as an informative lesson to humankind that you should treat abundance with respect. So we wanted to build the first greenhouse in the world that could contain a full-sized rainforest. We came upon this place, pushed our way through the bushes, being rather careful because we knew there was a precipice there. And we, we, we pushed the final row of stuff apart and there was this quite extraordinary kind of moon landscape. I walked to the edge and looked in and it really did look like, you know, like the lost world. This magnificent uh, quarry that was just going out of uh, its useful life. We knew it was where we wanted to build in the crater of a giant clay pit in Cornwall. I think we felt right from the beginning that the topography of this great kind of bowl should be 50% of the architecture, so we should work with it. The initial idea was to do trusses rather like the trusses at Waterloo, rather filigree kind of uh, uh, beams, leaning against the cliff face and to plant the cliff face so that it looked like the forest went on forever. The first challenge, actually, was nothing to do with those structures, or not much. It was actually to do with the nature of the ground. And while we were designing it, uh, they were still digging out the last remnants of the China clays. It's rather valuable stuff, this. So they were kind of scraping out the bowl, really, <laughs> taking the remaining stuff. The boys back at Grimshaw were getting increasingly irate with doing drawings where the foundation line was moving by 10 metres a week. We had to do the design, but all the time we are doing the design, the ground was shifting around because the mining was still taking place because the client couldn't buy the site until we could draw down the money from the Millennium Commission. So it was a kind of, you know, chicken and egg situation going on that was just brilliantly solved by a, a clever, ingenious, pragmatic design idea. Bubbles. They actually adjust to wherever the land is, but you still get the same bubbles. We came up with this idea of almost like a series of soap bubbles resting on the side of the quarry. It was a really intelligent piece of design thinking that kind of went along the lines of, if you take an entire sphere, you can embed that in the ground. And depending on where the ground level is, you can kind of cut the sphere at that point. The ground could move down by several metres or up by several metres, and we knew we could accommodate it with quite small changes to the overall scheme. There's no question that it's probably seen as an iconic building form, but it didn't come from any kind of notion that, oh, we want it to look like this. It came from absolute pragmatics. I love rainforests, but to be able to stand in one in Cornwall every day is, is a real privilege. You can sort of forget it's there. Then all of a sudden you look up and it's, oh yeah, this amazing thing's there again. This strange beehive-like structure. So a geodesic dome is a dome that's much like an old-fashioned football. It's a geometry of hexagons and pentagons. 
the kind of hex tri hex geodesic structural form you see at Eden, you find throughout nature. So all sorts of spheres, it's from pollen seeds to other forms, use that same mix of hexagons and pentagons to create the geometry. So a geodesic dome is an extremely unstable structure until it's complete. So I think we probably, during the construction of Eden, used almost all the scaffolding in southwest England. It was a very bad time to do a, an extension or any other building work. But there's another problem, of course. How do you glaze something like that? Plants require as much light as possible. Therefore, you want cladding which can span a long way and doesn't have any of its own substructure. So we decided in the end that we should use air-inflated pillows of a material called ETFE. It's incredibly light. An 11-metre hexagon can be lifted by one man. Compared to a glass and steel structure, it uses around 1% of the volume of material. So the final weight of the building is no more than the weight of the air inside the building. Not only is it much more economical, but it's also environmentally far more efficient. Our jobs can vary dramatically. General maintenance of the cushions, puncture repairs, some overpressurization, splits, bird pecks, all sorts really. Without these biomes, uh, there wouldn't be an Eden. You have to have that close relationship with the structure built up over time to understand what's going wrong or where a problem's occurring. And uh, yeah, I really do feel that they're part of my family that I'm responsible for and I care for. We designed the pillows so that they could be replaced. And over the years that that structure exists, more and more fascinating cladding systems might emerge and that eventually it might actually grow its own skin, a sort of clad, you know, with plant life. I think one of the big architectural issues of the future is realising the real significance of plants in human life. And the connection between plants and buildings can only get closer, I think. <laughs>